Welcome, everybody. It's another Tuesday night. We got the one and only regular Adam. Regular Adam. <laughs> it's regular Tuesdays with regular Adam. <laughs> the horseshoe kid right here. Jared are not watching his videos. You better check them out. <laughs> That's How, awesome. How are you doing, Mitch? Good, good. Busy, busy. Right on, buddy. Right on. That's awesome. I know you're crazy busy, too. Oh, yeah. And I thought winter was over, but we're getting more snow currently, so. Yeah. Did you well, uh, get a I thought chance? we were wrapping it up. Not yet. No. We had that cold spell, then March. We got to have March Madness snow. still, so I can't complain. Yeah. How's the ice looking down in your area? Um, It kind of differs lake to lake, but you're mostly pretty good. Um, like I was on some trout lakes a couple weeks ago and we had almost two feet and it was like 21, 22 inches, depending where you were. But, uh, I can't speak on some of the bigger lakes, um, like the pike lakes, like say Lake Newell couldn't tell you exactly. I have heard that there's about two feet there, but, uh, never trust what you hear. Always drill before you go out guys. Just make sure. Yeah. I know, uh, ice around here seems about regular for thickness. Yeah. Most of the bigger legs. Have you seen a difference this season from last season? Yeah, like we suffered a little bit there through that warm spell. Like January was incredibly warm, uh, kind of into the tub road into the start of February. It was definitely very warm, but we kind of got a cold snap there um, about a week ago. And that I think, I think that's going to save the ice big time. Um, yeah. But it was definitely looking a little rough down here early in yeah. February. Like, top sheets were really sketchy. Yeah, I was surprised that the tournament there two weeks ago, that how little ice where we usually fish was. Yeah, yeah. But that's a big lake, so. Yeah, really absolutely. Different. I mean, there's a lot of wind going across there. That ice is susceptible to a lot of stuff, so. But uh, that's that's the same problem we have here in southern Alberta. Is <laughs> they uh, warm winds? They just keep blowing, and they're they're kind of rough on the ice. But I'm thinking we're going to hold steady and be nice and strong through to the end of the season in mid March. There, yeah. Um, you're looking forward to some pike action and walleye. Yeah, dude. Like, I, so I'll be 100% honest with you guys. I haven't fished like um, maybe as aggressively as I normally do lately. So I'm really looking forward to March Madness pike. Um, big walleyes for sure. So, uh, I'm actually really excited for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. BC's <coughs> 20 inch, 21 inch. If you want to go, uh, bass fishing, go bass fishing, bass fishing is fun. I got to come see you, Craig and Sasha soon here. We'll, uh, do some open water bass and well, Sasha before- can school me again. School me again. Yeah. The girl is unreal. Top notch. <laughs> literally. Like, I, is, I'm like, so should I, like, I literally at one point I was like, so should I take this bobber off or, like, am I just completely wasting my time here? Because we were kind of fishing for sunfish and bass. She's yeah. like, she's like, take that bobber off. That's dumb. <laughs> 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 and boom, I'm starting catching fish because she was catching fish like mad. So it was funny. Awesome. Yeah, it's a blast out there. Oh, yeah. So many fish. It's always nonstop action. Great place to take kids. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, before we get in to talking big fish, we might as well bring in our buddy here. Big he fish expert. Down. Fish expert just came back down from the lodge. So he's back in reception. Scott, how you doing? Hey, good, 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 much doing good. Nice to see, uh, nice to see other one here as well. It's good <laughs> yeah. to see you, Scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We kind of fresh from the lodge. I'm sure you got some great stories for us. It was, uh, it was a really good trip actually. We did uh, for this is now like the second annual thing, but we did uh, Clayton Schick. So many are familiar with the angler. Clayton Schick does a a group event up there. Uh, this is the second year that we've did it, and uh, we go out, set up for, you know, there's 24 guests, I believe, four guides and Clayton, 
and uh, we set them up, take them out on day three days of uh, hardcore lake trout fishing, and it was a great trip. Like there was, so I think we got seven uh, masters, if you will, four of them over forty inches, and uh, for the group for the three days. So it's always nice when you can, you know, take guests out and. Uh, you know, kind of spread, we'd, we'd spread them up out over like a cluster of humps so no one was competing for fish. Yeah, you know, had for sure. Stay up right and, uh, you know, putting the deadlines into a, a different zone, but still keeping them all close to the shack. So we can uh, we had these guests spread right out across this cluster of humps and uh, between the four guides, we, uh, we managed seven big fish and plenty of other fish as well. But it was a, it was a good trip, man, for sure. That's epic. I mean, three days with four guides and Clayton Schick. I mean, that's a lot of knowledge, a lot of good times, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's a good time. And uh, oh, there was a little bit of ribbing going on between, like, Mac, myself, Daryl, <laughs> Emily, Clayton, uh, yeah. and the guests as well, right? And it, I mean, we're catering to, like, completely different skill sets uh, from your, your guys who just really wanted to go up and it was their first time going for a lake trout. Um, you know, be no experience to some really experienced anglers coming in from the US and stuff like that for that trip, uh, and that whole bunch of personality as well, right? So it's uh, it's always a good time when you get a, a good mixed group on the ice, and oh, definitely, uh, yeah, and everybody catches fresh, everybody has a good time, so it was uh, it was pretty sweet, bro. It's pretty sweet, that's awesome. How much ice do they have up there? Oh, we get we're, we're in the extension season now, so mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, there's quite a bit. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be worrying too much about ice conditions here, but there was actually. No, I, I'm more just like curious how much ice yeah. would be there, but like you think like three, four feet. There's there's some spots where you could get through without an extension, but you you have to okay. dig in snow and really get down to the the power head to get through. So yeah. uh, and then there's other spots where you definitely need an extension. So like bet between the big lake and the little lake, there's a, a varying amount of depths. But like nothing, yeah. to, nothing to cause concern. I started yeah. to get, I started to get some slush patches and stuff like that as well. Oh, okay, yeah. On the lake, so that's more like what we're looking at right now is like slush management and you know making sure that we're aware of these areas and we can keep our guests out of them. If there's always times when you're going to be having to to get through it to get to certain spots and stuff like that, yeah. but uh, that's really the main concern up at the lodge right now. It's not even a concern as yet. You start getting into, uh, you know, like and stuff like that, it gets, gets a little bit chaotic. And then yeah, you go back, yeah. back up in April again, and then you're on the high ice, and the fishing's just off the hook, man. Like, off the hook. That's epic. What, what are you running for augers up there? Uh, I'm actually, a oh, funny story, I wrecked my auger on the first day. Uh, I took out one of the brand new Lodge Bearcats with the auger rack in the front. So on my sled, I've got a boot in the back, like an auger boot. And uh, first trip out onto the big lake, one of the guests, the uh, straps came loose and like ran straight over the top of it with the Bearcat, like power head destroyed. <laughs> so that was like, that was me straight away. I was like, oh, what a start, right? And then, uh, <laughs> so, but I normally use, I normally use a Strike Master 40 volt. But the uh, the lodge actually they were given uh, by Jason Mitchell and Clam um, some prototype uh, clam augers which are 120 volt mm. uh, lithiums. 120 volt. Uh, they got a bunch of them, so I managed to get one of them off the lodge to try down south and uh, just to kind of test it out and see what it's like. So I'll probably be using that this weekend. Uh, oh right so on. See how that goes. Uh, and that's until I get my new power head for my uh, <laughs> for my strike master. But I know that's like, rough, man. Yeah, but I know like guys are using those like uh, the the ion alphas and stuff like that, and they're yeah. really liking them as well. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'll try anything, but I'm quite happy with strike master. To be honest. Yeah. There's a ton of great options nowadays for augers, but I think like honestly, if you're not using an electric, you're kind of you're kind of falling behind, honestly. Well, like, I don't, like, I'm in my mid 40s now. I don't want to be hauling about a Z71 <laughs> with a bag and like that. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do that, and there's no friggin' way I would go back to it, man. <laughs> yeah, Dude, it's like seven in the morning. And... 
the sun's barely coming up and all of a sudden bam 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 it's like <laughs> oh, damn you <laughs> not bro <Yeah. laughs> and especially like when i've got the perma shack as well so you don't want to be like gassing up the inside of your shack so it's like with the kids and stuff Absolutely. i can just go into the electric zip 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 easy is before we had to have like the doors open for a bit before i'd even let the kids go into the shack because of the fumes right so yeah 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 for the shacks, yeah, I'm thinking I gotta get mine on Kijiji or something here before everyone else realizes that gas augers are a thing of the past. <laughs> get rid of that bad boy. Yeah, especially if you like, like you like to hike into places and stuff like that. And any weight you can cut down is. Yeah, like I honestly, I use an e-drill all year, so just yeah. like a flight attached to my Milwaukee, and it it's awesome to two feet of ice. So. Yeah, we used uh, Broden's pistol bit last time so i didn't even have to bust out the big jiffy oh dude they're just so handy so light like you can drill like i don't know depends on how much ice you have but like on a five amp hour battery you're drilling a ton of holes yeah we so have if you got amps. four or five of them like you can drill spreads all over the place yeah and like they're just so light for and like you say scott i love to hike in so that's the ultimate in light i think yeah 100 percent so we're talking big pike it's coming march great time for them walleye adam doesn't want to talk about lakers anymore because we've talked about lakers too much yeah <laughs> i don't fish lakers very much so like i just don't want to like shoot the breeze with them like hey yeah when they're coming yeah, up to call them just keep reeling <laughs> we, we've been talking about lakers for a couple of weeks now so yeah yeah Let's get on that pike and walleye. I know we're going to have some friends from Lake Winnipeg coming up here for March Madness 2 on the show. So oh, sick. We'll get that bite going. But nice. Yeah, yeah the walleye bite's going to start okay. heating up, and I'm really fired up for that. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think the next like six weeks for us, it's now I'm starting to kind of get excited for doing pike again. Yeah. It's, you know, it's good weather. I can get the kids out. You know, the days are getting longer as well. And, uh, yeah, like, I, I can't wait to start setting the tip-ups and the fullers and getting yeah. the kids running like crazy over for those uh, for those flags, man. It's going to be good. Yeah, I got to say, the days getting longer is one of the nicer things. Like, uh, looking, seeing the sun still up and just, or just barely going down, sorry, at like six is awfully nice lately compared to four o'clock, so. Oh, yeah. I did coach in the Cold Lake Derby. Is that illegal? Did we just, did we just wrap ourselves up? You coached somebody, <laughs> I don't know. I was, I was coaching. I was like, if I was there, this is what I would do. And I guess it worked a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Pike. And say you're just going to some random lake. Say we're going. Let's see where I got this. Let's go to Lake Newell. I just picked a classic lake in the middle of Alberta. But say you're headed here. What kind of structure are you going to set up for that March bite? You realize I gotta zoom in to see that. Yeah, me too. Okay, okay so I might make some funny faces because I'm looking around. Oh God, you're zooming now. Well, I'm oh. zooming for you. Oh, that I appreciate that. Do you want me to scan it? Yeah, let's scroll down the lake real slow, like. Just tell me when to stop. Put on like a Justin Timberlake song, maybe. Oh, Ooh, that's so that cool. looks like my area. That looks tasty. Yeah, so that's 10 foot. So just above here, like that 10 foot flat that we're seeing there, off the nine and a half sharp drop there, and it kind of sticks out. I don't know if there's uh, any current possibly coming through there, but uh, that definitely looks like an area I'm going to target for sure right off the hop. Yeah, that's in my depth that. range. I like to be I like to be anywhere from 10 to 12 feet for a really big pike. Uh, I, that's typically a little deeper than a lot of guys like to fish, but uh, I see that drop ends right at nine and a half and runs out to 10 there. And uh, that's where I'm going to be. Tech typically I want to be on the outside of it. Um, 
normally really large fish are going to come from the deep and move up shallow or they're going to eat shallow and move deep. So the, the last energy they can expend going up and then dropping back is ideal for them because it's easier to digest those big meals if they're a little deeper. So that's where I'm going to start so far. Where do you think, Scott? Can I move this map around? I can no. move it around. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But on, like on that flat where Adam was, and I was going to agree with that, like uh, what you've got is you've got that coming in for shallow, then you've got a steeper drop, and then it really just flattens off. Uh, and then you've got a drop off there. So, like, I, for sure I would have one on the flat. I would have maybe have one down in this kind of north, kind of end of the flat in the corner. This side? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I mean, it looks like the basin so far is really only about 16 feet. So yeah. you're on be, that. I'm assuming there would be pike uh, on that transition from the – it almost looks like a step there where we've got the shallow, the flat, and it steps yeah. down and then flattens out. So anywhere in that area, even having bait suspended over the drop uh, for fish to come up and see, you know, like yeah. have, it, have it over the 14 but have it suspended at 10. Oh, yeah. Just for the cruisers. Yeah. Anything else? So that looks like, so, like, I mean, I realize this isn't pike, but that 19 and a half foot flat over there. Um, so that's kind of an interesting spot because you have, looks like a, like a 14 foot channel leading up to, kind of a wall so that would be a place i would camp at and then you can slide into that drop in the daytime and fish those walleyes a little deeper but you'll catch those a lot of cruising fish coming up onto the flat that we just discussed fishing on top of if you're camping in there and another thing is maybe look for like inflows on the lake you know where there's like streams running in things like that Especially in March right now. Yeah, exactly. Like, like we don't have a ton in Alberta here. We don't have a ton of lakes with creeks and streams coming into them. Um, but even those canals, guys, like the canals, if it's if it's wow, I am zoomed right in. Me too. There we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow, that's a nice mustache, kid. Uh, but no, um, so the canals, like when if there's a spillway nearby. Um, even that little bit of melt that comes through and comes down there produces a natural little current around these reservoirs that we have here in Southern Alberta. So it's really key to kind of focus around the shelf. That's going to work with that. So Greg, Greg legend. What's up, buddy? Yeah, there's a lot of Brandon. There. Yeah. I think if that, that, that water is running and it's warmer, you know, and like these pike are starting to get into that. They want those kind of warm up, so they're going to be hanging around there, you know. Oxygen's super depleted yeah, this time yeah. of year, so anything coming in is going to, that oxygen environment is going to bring the fish in for sure, so. Yeah, I know that lake has no freshwater intake just due to the carp situation right now, so they're okay. not filling oh, it. Oh, wow. Because they don't want to fill it with carp. So. You got to go down in those basins, then turn your live scopes around and just start hammering those carps. Yeah. That's what you got to do before you go get the big pike. Well, Save it's the not lake. in there yet, supposedly. Oh, yeah. Is that three mile bend? Was that, J did you just give us JNAP's spot? <laughs> no, that was goal. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. But, uh, yeah. Do you guys find um, north sides of lakes in the spring are better? I've heard this uh, just because they get a little more sunlight, maybe a little more heat. Uh, if it's getting more sunlight and more heat, then, then sure. I don't know if it's necessarily always the north side, especially down here. Like we don't have, there's no trees. Like every lake's getting sunshine all day long. So, um, <laughs> But, like, temperature, the water temperature makes a huge difference at that time of year, so. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Like any, uh, first thing I'm going to look for is, like, shallow bays and things like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, no matter the aspect. And, again, I'm in the prairies. We, we, like, down south here, 
like you're pretty much getting sun as soon as it's coming up. Yeah. You know, there's, there's no mountains in the way or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we kind of showed the structure there. What kind of vegetation are you guys looking for in those areas? Weed lines, dead weed lines. I mean, there's not going to be a ton of alive stuff right now, but uh, dead weed lines matted down um, always provide. They give them a little bit of camouflage, right? So uh, if I can find the weed line, usually I'm going to set up. Lately, I've started setting up on just onto the weeds, um, not so much into the sand anymore. I'll camp in the sand um, because it is a lot better to jig, pound through the night for walleyes. Um, but I like to have that big bait soaking for the bike just inside the weed line. And like I say, they're all matted down. So my sucker is typically just hovering just above. Yeah. Any, tra any transition areas like going from rock to, to sand or mud or whatever, like you'll find them cruising along the, the edge of those structures and things like that. So your, your, your transition lines, if you've got a long flat, long drop off, and then going on to like, you know, sand or silt from rock, they're always kind of cruising around about that, especially in the shallows as well. Absolutely. Do you find that long drop off just gives them better visual to see that prey and instead of being on a sharp drop off? I think that, I think it will, it will dictate the fish will move along the side of the structure. So if it's, you know, it's almost like a path where you're yeah. kind of setting it up. Like I really like, um, do I talk about lakers or anything, but like fishing trenches and things like that, where especially deep where the fish are moving along through there, uh, especially the larger ones. So, I mean, and often when I'm pike fishing, if I'm going to be using tip-ups and things, I've normally got kids with me, so I really get the opportunity to like work different depths in different areas, you know, two lines each and I've got, you know, two kids. That's six lanes I can set out. Or if you're going out with the, the boys, we'll spread our tip ups, you know, in the bays and things, and just kind of have a look to see what's triggering and why. You know, so there's a lot of times we're going into lakes in the back country where there is no mapping. You know, you're you're yeah. you're just driving, you're popping lake to lake, and you maybe see like a spot that it looks fishy and you know it looks pikey, and we'll we'll just drive the snowmobiles in and start drilling holes and kind of try to figure it out for the ground up, you know. For sure. Do you uh, check out the like the Google Maps for satellite before you head out and I kind of try sure to get some structure? For sure, if you're if you're like, on a mission to a certain lake, I would definitely do as much reconnaissance on it as possible. Uh, even like trails in and out and stuff like that, because like if you're heading out into the backcountry, safety is going to be paramount as well. And uh, I think any of these tools are super helpful. You know, Google Maps, Google Earth. Uh, any satellite imagery you can see, you know, in the summertime will give you a good idea in the wintertime is where you should be looking. You know, seeing the shallow areas, seeing, seeing reefs, seeing weed lines from an aerial view just gives you a good idea. And then, you know, you're going to, you're going to drill holes to try and find that stuff yeah. uh, or find the structure. But well, it's definitely pays to do a bit of homework before you go into the, the back country for sure. 100%. And like one thing, one thing I want to mention about Pike too is like, once you so say you are um, like you like you mentioned, and do do you check out uh, a chart? So like once you've checked out a chart and you go to a lake, um, and that spot does produce a big fish, it's like like I have found anyways down here, um, those spot on the spots will produce year after year as long conditions permitting, as long as your conditions are are typical. Um, then they're going to produce year after year. So if you do have big pike spots, realize what's going on in them and, and why that's happening because then you can locate them on other lakes as well, right? That's all transferable knowledge. So, 100%. Are you guys – um? so we're talking tip-ups. What are you guys running for your tip-ups? Like line, what kind of tip-up, what kind of rig? I just finished – I like big hand. I like hand over hand tip ups. Honestly, um, sorry Scott. Um, I like hand over hand tip ups um, big time. Um, 
they're just really easy to use. Um, never have to worry about freeze up. And I do have like an HT, so kind of like the finicky ruler. Um, and I am a big fan of it because I, I came up with like a, a little hole cover that works for me. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a, definitely a big fan of uh, a typical hand over hand tip up when it comes to targeting really big pike with really big baits. Um, I just find you don't get as many false flags. And uh, I feel like I have a little more control, I guess. I'm sure it's a blast fighting them on a, on a big rod, but I, I definitely like hand over hand tip ups. I uh, I prefer fighting them on a rod for sure, but again, if I'm out with the family, I'd maybe get four rods out and two tip ups, and just it's like, just as much fun battling a big fish on uh, a hand over hand as as with a rod. Uh, but a lot of the times. What I'll do is if it's a really big bait, we'll use the, the thermal cover tip-ups. And then what my normal bait for, for pike would be, would be like a, a, I want to say like an 8 to 10 inch herring. Uh, and on a single treble, even like a one-up, like, a, a, like it could be yeah. big. And, right. uh, and then I would run 8 pound fluorocarbon from that to my to my braid, which would be a 20 to 30 pound braid because, because it's on my spinning wheels, right? So, uh, You're running eight pound floral from that? I says 80. Oh, it sounded like <laughs> eight. I was like, oh, yeah, oh my gosh. Finesse it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I was a like, big bike on the finicky pooler. Right, right. <laughs> Just wishing on a dream with that. Right. <laughs> um, I, I lost a big I lost a big lake a uh, couple of weeks ago when I was up on that trip doing the filming for Wild TV and uh, like uh, uh, you, you need to be prepared and like you know like mm -hmm. I see guys who are going to end up using like walleye gear to try and catch a big pike and stuff and uh, yeah. it normally ends in disaster you know like yeah. you get snapped off so easily so I mean I get snapped off on 20 pound braid on a giant, like a complete giant, and uh, oh. it's going to be embarrassing when it shows on TV. I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> like, oh man, like if it's it was the rod was buckled, man, like bro, oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I lost that fish, so I'll be fun to watch. Just heartbreaking. Like, oh, it was. Like, Did it was they show the whole like, thing, and I, you're just like, like, I've I've co I've watched it like a hundred times over. Now, like, I've <laughs> it, <laughs> like I've lost sleep over it. And uh, I, I'll be honest, and you know, people say it's a fish story, but it was the heaviest lake that I have ever had on a line, man. It was a giant. And Mac was with me, and like the rod was bent. I tried to lift it, I, I got it about, what I say, about 10 feet off bottom, just come vapor trailed in and was like smoked my, my jig and uh, jig with a tube. And uh, I got it up to, like, I set the hook and I got up to, like, 30 feet off bottom and then it just peeled to bottom. And I, my drag's pretty tight and I lifted, try to lift the fish and it was, it was just moving drag. The fish wasn't moving off a of bottom. So yeah. I tightened my drag up and tightened my drag up just to try and get it off bottom. And it was fighting hard. And I think that's what caused it, the line fatigue on the... Uh, on the bottom of the hole from fishing that line all season long and that, right. gi that giant fish, you know, like it just, and then snap, it was gone, man. And like, you know, we've all, we've all lost big ones, right? But like devastation uh, uh, in front of the cameras. Try to act a hard man, I was like almost crying. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's tough, man, that's tough. And like you say, it's all, it's in front of the cameras, like, oh. And that, but that's all part of fishing as well, right? Like, it's, it yeah. happens, man. Like, lost fish and, like... You got to lose them so that you can appreciate the big ones, right? Real, man. For real. 100%. Because yeah. uh, I think if I caught every big fish I ever hooked, I'd probably get over certain fish species pretty quick. Yeah. yeah but yeah. Uh, I got a lot of things that I owe a little payback to, so... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keeps you know, me going you, back. Sometimes, sometimes you you go to earn it, right? And like redemption's yeah. like a big thing, man. Like that's that's a lot of drive because you you know you might have a really bad trip or something may happen, and you leave the lake and you you're driving home. It's the worst feeling ever. 
<laughs> yeah. Neil Elmo doing this again, and as soon as you unpack, all you're thinking about is going back up to get that fish. Right? Your rods are rigged and ready to go. Yeah, you're at right. work the next day, going, "When I go, I'm I'm doing this. This is what I'm doing when I go back oh, next yeah. time. This I'm going to be ready." Just yeah. drives a guy, I think. Yeah. Oh, it drives a guy insane half the time. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're just waiting for that one moment again. Yeah. yeah. And reliving, yeah. The, reliving the nightmare that happened on the trip to make you feel like that, like constantly, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> what? Reliving when your otter had got video. ran over. <laughs> yeah, that's another one, right? <laughs> yeah, but I think some of the best trips happen, like, with a hardship at the beginning, right? Oh, 100%. Like it's, it's not, going wrong, then there's that just one fish that just like. <laughs> because if yeah. you don't grind, you don't deserve it. If, it, yeah. it's, if, it's, if it's not, it's not an adventure until something goes wrong. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a stroll. <laughs> um, with your tip ups, I know you kind of said a bit about your line. Do you run the same line on your rods as your tip ups, or are you run a different combo? No, the tip ups are like I, I, the thermal tip ups that I use were already pre spooled, yeah. uh, and it's I don't know what the, the poundage is on it, but like it's it's good enough for the pipe that I catch for sure. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some of this like expensive tip up line. For all that I use it, I'm never going to buy it. But I know a couple of guys who have used it, and uh, I've I've caught a fish with it, and it's game changing. But like it's it's all big money for something you can get already equipped with the the yeah. unit that you're buying, right? So for yeah. sure. What I what like. So I I got these uh, tip ups from Walmart. They're just HT ones that have a really really big spool on them, which I like. Um, it's just like the HT big game one. Um, and what I just did is I just wrapped a whole bunch of 80 pound braid as backing. And then I just put a spool of 50 pound tip up line on there and works great for me. Yeah. Um, the nice thing about the tip up line is it's metered. Um, and I realize that doesn't matter to you if you got a fish finder, if you don't have a fish finder, that might be nice. I mean, it's not necessarily necessary, but, uh, if you don't have a DPR, you know what, where you drop it to on your line every time. You find bottom one time when you drop down your little weight, and then you can just drop to that same spot every time, which is kind of nice. But Yeah. And uh, if you're running suspended, I know with those tip-ups, I know um, how high are you suspending that usually? Just depends how deep you are or? Depends on the area where I'm fishing as well, I guess. Uh, but like, if I'm fishing close to home here, normally I'm suspending my bait anywhere from you know a couple of inches to you know mid column, mm -hmm. uh, depending on whereabouts from the lake we are that day or what area we're fishing. Uh, but my standard is I like to have it even just like just like a foot off bottom, you know, just have it sitting there. Uh, for sure. But whatever, I know some guys like to have their baits head pointing down. Some guys like using, you know, a quick strike with double trebles to suspend, you know, those larger baits a little bit bigger. Everybody's got their preference, like, in how they would rig it. I mean, I don't know what what's your preference on, like, rigging, Adam? Like, like so when I rig my tip ups, I just have like a double treble rig, but it's on a single, so it's not the pyramid style. Sorry, it's not the pyramid style like this. So it's just a single piece of fluorocarbon that comes down. The one eyelet's just threaded through the line, so it's free sliding, so I can adjust it for how big my bait is. But uh, like as for suspending it, I usually only suspend them um, early season, typically, or if it kind of depends on what bait I'm using as well. Like if I'm using a herring or something, I do like to suspend it a foot off bottom. Um, but a lot of times right now I'm using a sucker um, later on in the season. So I'll, I'll lay that just off bottom. And like Scott says, some guys like to have the heads all the way down like this. I put like a little jig head on, on my split ring. And basically it's on a little piece of 10-pound line so that can break off at any point. 
it's got no hook on it. It's just there to weight my sucker down a little bit. So it's not sitting fully head down. It just kind of looks like a feeding sucker going across the bottom. Gives it a little more natural feel. Will you I guys think. run a, a dead stick on the bottom? Like a, it, depending, like, will you put that on weeds? Or do you usually try to just do that over sand more? Uh, I typically don't put it right on bottom ever. Um, usually it's always just kind of hovering or suspended to about a foot. Um, early season, I will suspend it like mid column or so. So, but later on, I like to be down at the near the bottom. Yeah. Um, Scott, um, what do you use for like for your rod tip up? Because I notice there's more and more options coming out. I see. Uh, I hear you mentioned the finicky cooler. I've seen them on Clayton's videos. They look like they're a pretty great option. Yeah. Um, yeah, my yeah. HT one, I'm just not a fan of. And I, I, I've i never used an iFish Pro, but I'm not a fan of them. I can tell right off the hop. So. I've never I've never used an iFish Pro, but I, I do have a good collection of the XT riggers in my garage for sure. That's yeah. what I used before. Um, the thing with that being is like for pike fishing, they weren't really suitable because of the rods I was using. They had a larger butt. So they yeah. didn't. And so you would have to like set the butt of your rod into the snow, have the 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 rigger set aside from that, and have you know it pulled down and rigged oh, yeah. beside the just. So that's one thing I like about the fillers is they can take a, a larger butt, especially when you're you know you're dropping ciscos for lakers or you know suspending larger baits for for pike. You can have that rod. You can have a quick, easy access. It's just a single ring that the the butt would sit in. So you're not right. going to try and pull it out. Um, and you can adjust the sensitivity on them. But I'll tell you what, bro, man, the hole covers are a frigging game changer, man, especially like up north and things. It's yeah, like a it's, it's like a kind of compact, kind of foam type thing. Super durable, uh, black with a cover. So once you've yeah. drilled your, your 10 inch, you would sit it right on top and then put the cover with a line. And like they are they're the business man. Like you don't need no okay. check the holes, everything's set. And uh again this flag goes, pop it out, just take the whole cover off. Sometimes what I'll do is if I'm like especially with pike and stuff like that, if it's been super windy, I'll take the, the bottom whole cover off and just feed it through the rod before I set the hook. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Just in case. So I've got a little bit more room when I go to try and get Absolutely. You know, the ice kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but I'd, I'd recommend them. Like, I uh, I saw a couple of guys using them, and I was like, straight away, I was like, oh, yeah, I need to go into this. So. Yeah, because, yeah. like, that's the, that's the other thing. Like you mentioned, the rod butts don't fit in the, the HT ice rigger. Yeah. So what I did was I took one of the mounts off my tenner for my Berkeley rod holder and put it on. Yeah. But it's still, unless I put a raised mount on it now, it sits too low to the ground, so it kind of awkwardly yeah. sits in there. So I'm still not a fan of it. And, really. and these things pack flat, like you would pack like like this. Yeah, yeah. that's sick. Uh, uh, you, you take your uh, rod holder out, and then you just push it back in there. So there's just a coil here. Yeah. And like the the really easy to pack. You know, you can pack four, and only be like that much space. You know? Yeah, that's beautiful. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. They're like a catch cover for open water fishing instead of in your ice shack, pretty much. Yeah, yeah that's sick. Maybe I'll have to look into one of those. I don't know if there's anywhere in Alberta that I can get them, but maybe I can. I think there's a few stores from out there that you can order them from. Yeah, you can get stuff mailed to Manitoba pretty easily for sure. I know guys have done it. Yeah. Kevin What's wants it to know called? what the it's called. It's called the Finicky Fuller. That's a good name. I like that. I dig it. Yeah, hard to it's say. Because you're using eight pound fluorocarbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, with that, um, do you guys jig a lot, or are you guys just running dead sticks in March? You know, I, sometimes I'll, I'll I'll jig maybe like a. You know, almost like a lake trout bait, like a three-quarter ounce uh, airplane jig. 
you know, with the bucktail on it kind of thing. Something moving, you know, I've used big rattle baits. I've used, I've caught big pike on small rattle baits as well. Uh, so no, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely all for it, especially if you're sitting in the shack and like the weather's brutal, you can always have a line in the shack and have a tip up outside and yeah. you know, keep yourself busy. I'm more just, yeah, like I more just jig because I'll get maybe bored of having yeah. two tip-ups, so I'll pull a tip up and I'll start jigging for a bit, usually a big bucktail. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. If, if I'm trying to target a really big fish, I'm probably having just a big dead bait sitting there. Um, I seen the smelts versus herring question there. Yeah, um, I was asking. That's definitely a dependent on the day thing for me anyways in Alberta. Um, I find that there's some days where the jumbo smelts are way better. Some days the herring are way better. And some days if you don't have suckers, you're probably not going to catch a big one. So do you, do you think sometimes between the smelts and herrings that it's just lighting? It's the smell. Just the smell? Right. It won't be and, the differentiation of the color off them? Uh, probably a little bit, but I think it's more just like, like an oiliness and, yeah. and scent to it. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've fished with smelts. If I've got the kids out, I've fished with smelts, like small ciscos, like eight-inch ciscos, and uh, and herring. And uh, I found that we, we caught a lot of big ones that day, but they were all hitting on the cisco, and this was a lake that didn't have ciscos in it. Oh yeah, so I feel like that was a natural forage for uh, yeah. any of these uh, these fish. Uh, but normally, like ciscos can be hard to come by, so like, I I always go for I'd rather go for herring over smelt as well. well like, I I've always found like everyone will be like, oh, I got large smelts, and they'll bring out these smelts that are like six inches, yeah. seven inches, maybe. I'm for some reason maybe I'm lucky. I get these smelts that are probably like 10, 12, like they're yeah. jumbo and like they're like thick like herring too. So uh, they work pretty good. But like I say, like some days, like if you if you have a smelt on it and a herring, I literally will run a little experiment. Yeah. And like you say, Scott, the herring will way out for sure. Yeah. And sometimes what I like to do is like I'll score the herring first. A little my buddy here, I've got like a little kind of girl thing. That sits oh, yeah, there. yeah. Just, just let it sit there and kind of warm up and like having a couple of scores along the belly. Again, just to allow a little bit of scent, like just to kind of help that, uh, you know, anything you can do. And uh, one thing I really like about using herring is the hook. Like if you're, that, whatever kind of rig setup you want to use, hooks pull out of herrings really, really nicely. Yeah. Um, so like I fish a lot of suckers. If you don't reef, or set the hook like you're trying to break your fishing rod, you're you're probably yeah. not going to pull the hooks out. You even if you do clean the scales off, um, you got to really set the hook. Um, with a herring, I find it's such a sm much smoother process. Yeah, slice and smash page. <laughs> <laughs> Get that oil moving. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, do you guys, I know Adam does, uh, the live well procedures on the ice. Scott, do you guys do that too up? Uh, you know what we try and, and when it's cold for sure, or where you're, you're, you're close to your shack and you're running that fish right into the heat straight away. Like, uh, but normally like if we are fishing, like if I'm out, I'll, you know, have a buddy will hold it in. Frozen hard, right? like you say, rather, I would rather freeze the shit out of my hand than mm -hmm. freeze the shit out of fish. Like, it's, yeah. like, that fish is more important than my hand being cold for, mm -hmm. you know, 15 minutes or whatever, you know, between in and out. Like 15 minutes, like five minutes in freezing water. Uh, mm -hmm. Or somebody to get a bump board or if it's a big fish to get a measurement and a picture, keep it in the water. But like, we'll bring it up, bump, bump, and then straight back down again. Uh, yeah. That and that's the ideal situation. I just end up alone all the time. So the live well thing and I'm kinda of artsy fartsy, so I just lay the fish in there, take a couple snaps of it and send her back down. But uh 
yeah, like you say, Scott, there's there's no point in uh, holding that fish out of the water. You can you can keep your hand in the water for five minutes okay. if if your buddy needs to go grab the camera and the bump board. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's that's nothing compared to having a fish freeze its eyeballs, freeze its fins, and die. Right. Or whatever, so. Yeah, the water. That's the, the biggest thing. Keep the, the fish submerged, like not just like, oh, it's half in the water. No, yeah. like get it submerged, like mouth below the water. Get your hand cold. Your hand's gonna be soaking wet. But I, I try to, I like, guess as well. Like if I see the maybe the the, the fish up for longer than they should, I just kind of say, everyone, say imagine we were holding your head underwater. Yeah. Long as that fish was getting held out there, that fish is drowning right yeah. there. Yeah. So, like, it's as quick as you can, like, you know. And like, you know what? If you need two or three pictures, maybe you want a couple different angles, and your buddy's slow on the camera, you go up, back in the water. Yeah. For sure. Are you ready? Up. Yeah. Like, it's it's about the fish. So, yeah. do your best to take care of them. And I realize right now we're dealing with some pretty. I mean, pretty above average weather, I'd say. But, uh, I mean, you're still holding it. Like you said, you're drowning. You're holding it out of water. It can't breathe. It's cold. Just up quick, get your pitcher, get it back down. Yeah, I know the tournament lasts two weekends ago. It was windy, but the temperature wasn't bad. But you still set up that shack so you can get that fish into the shack yeah. from wherever your dead stick is. And it's yeah. going to be a lot nicer for that fish. You can put it down there. Everyone's warmer. Like you're going to be uh -huh. warmer. You can control the situation better. The fish is going to be a lot better off than in that wind chill. Oh, yeah. You got to think the fins are like like potato chips, man. Yeah. No freeze in a second. Yeah. Do you guys have any tips for some awesome pictures when you catch that next trophy? I, like I say, I'm a big fan of live wild pictures. Um, hero shots um, with them big, big trophy pike look absolutely epic um, for sure. But uh, last year, I, uh, I really experimented with just laying a couple giants in the live wild. And like I say, just shooting head first, real low to the ice, down the fish, and kind of just barely capturing the horizon in the photo. And that made for my favorite photos of the year for sure yeah. we're all really low angle live well shots um but like i said i am fishing by myself so i didn't really have a chance for a whole lot of hero shots the cover photo is the photo of me after i dropped my phone down the hole <laughs> and unhooked that fish so i look incredibly unhappy <laughs> but my mustache is relatively similar so let's hope i have good luck again you got to start spinning that upwards so you look happier. I tr I trim it to this length. What you Otherwise, it will grow, it so will grow to that ridiculousness. Then you don't got to <laughs> smile because this mustache smiles for you. I just don't want to look like I uh, – and no offense to hipsters. I just am not one. <laughs> um, those mustaches were cool back in the day when, when they were on Real Men. <laughs> um, do you have any tips, Scott? Uh, fuck if we're going to talk about it, I'm too busy laughing about his mustache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll get a good photo. Right, okay. Uh, you know, like, if you've got a guy taking a picture, make sure that you're, you've got good light. Because I see a lot of pictures where it would have been a great picture if the guy who was taking the photo had they been creating a shadow over the top of the fish or the back of the fish. I think mm -hmm. if it's a, like a you've got like a like a trophy pipe. Let's talk trophy pipe, right? Uh, is to be on your knees. You know, don't you don't have to stand up to get the photo. I think a lot of the really good photos are when you're on your knees. It's also safer that you're not going to drop the fish should it give you, you know, it starts going berserk on you. Uh, you don't want to drop it on the ice, so like being closer to the, the ice is definitely a, I think it looks great in photographs. Uh, you're able to support me, you can maybe put your hands on your knees if the fish is heavy. Uh, what I like to do is with the back 
fin is like I almost kind of balance the back of it. I always kind of balance the back of the fish just on my fingertips to kind of show the whole fish. Um, you know, with, and again, the ice fishing, some people don't agree with open water, whatever you have, but definitely with those larger fishes, a good, a good gill hold. I know we talk about gill holds and things, but with pike, you know, you, can, you don't want to drop that fish, you don't want it to smash onto the ice. And, you know, getting underneath the head is good if the fish is not going to like, go nuts on you. Uh, but try and showcase as much as the fish as you can. Like, uh, I, I often say, you know, it's the, the photographs are about the fish, not the guy who caught it, right? It's like, show it off, let people appreciate the, the beauty of that thing, you know, the age of that thing. Uh, and that's kind of how I like to do my photographs. You know, like having a good camera. It's always always makes for a, a good photo as well, you know, like mm-hmm. being able to work your, your cameras, you know, if you want to have a, like a, a, a soft set in the, the, the background where it's a little bit kind of blurrier, uh, where a real focus on the fish looks good. You know, some guys are just really good at taking sunset pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I've like, taken a few of those as well right now. <laughs> I like, like... Like almost having, if I'm going to be taking pictures, I almost like, like to be here because if you're, if like Scott says, you don't want to shine, shine a shadow over your buddy, first of all. Um, but you also like, I find direct sunlight right at the fish is really hard on a lot of fish to yeah. actually see how beautiful the fish you're holding is. Um, so kind of angling that. towards the head. I find in shooting, you're almost still shooting straight on, but you're angled towards the head. Often, I mean, if you want, it'll make the fish look bigger. You'll be able to see a lot more of the color in the fish. And uh, I don't know, it's just a little more artsy fartsy than just straight on blown out by the sun. Yeah, never take one straight on the sun, especially on a sunny day. Rainbows and stuff will just get, the color just gets blown out. If you're trying yeah. to take a shot like that. Rainbows especially. Rainbows are really, yeah. really cool. go f- Go from a side. Yeah. And make sure you got a bit of an angle on it. And if you're in a shack, make sure to close your windows that are behind you. And honestly, if you like really just don't know what you're doing, here's your buddy holding the fish like this. Just get your camera or get your phone or whatever and just start taking photos and work like this because you can go like this really fast and move around slowly enough that it's going to capture it like clearly. If you have no idea what you're doing, I don't know. That works so well for you'll get 10 great photos in 10 seconds. And a lot of guys that will fish themselves will just do a video. Yeah. Video 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 pointed at you. You can physically adjust to to suit the the snap. And I don't know I've, Grabbed a few screenshots in my time as well. So, yeah, because sure self timers are really well. hard. Fish don't want to behave at 10 seconds or five seconds. You don't want to have them up for 10 seconds if you can't avoid it. Like all kinds of things, right? Like timers are just kind of a joke. So, having a having the self recorder going at you, grabbing a screenshot is going to be crystal clear. You'll be good to go. Yeah, the less time you have that fish out of the water, the better. I've I've tried to mess like before the fish comes up, have it already set on a timer. Then you put it up. Then it's just like timer. Then you dump it. Then you look at it and you're like, yeah, well, <laughs> maybe next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the most important thing is getting that fish back healthy. And so someone else can catch it or maybe you'll catch it down the road. So. I hate to do this, but I just got a message from someone that said it's really important. Can you call me? And they tried to call me. That's why I made the weird face there. Um, I think I got to go. Yeah, no problem. I'm sorry, guys. See you later. Later, buddy. Adam's gone. You can catch him at the Horseshoe Kid. Make sure you subscribe and check out his videos. And uh, we're pretty much out of time as well. You got anything else to add? No, it's just good to be on again. Nice to 
See, yeah, I, I thought you were just going to come on for a second, drop some knowledge, and be like, I'm done, I'm hungry. <laughs> you know what? The, the, the wife's upstairs with the kid watching TV. I'm like, I've got the living room with myself. I'm about to stay on and hang out with some buddies, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, thanks for having us on. It's super cool, man. It's nice. It's always good to hear from you, Adam, as well. And like, let's just say there's a, a good bit of knowledge shared tonight. So that's, that's always a good thing as well. Yeah. Thanks for being on, Scott. Where can they find you? Daft Scotty on Instagram and uh, Scott Conley on Facebook. You know, and, uh, watch. Yeah. Ask for him at Baker's Narrow. He's the guy to get, so make sure that you get him. There's, and, a, there's a ton of good guides there. Like, there's, there's lots of good guides. There's seriously better. good guides up there, guys. <laughs> like, yeah. Like they work hard and like they're super knowledgeable. Like book with any guide up there and you'll be looked after for sure. Thanks a lot. Man. 100%. You're a great guy. We'll see you later down the road, Scott. I'm sure. Betcha. Betcha. So everybody have a great Tuesday night. We'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>